Welcome everybody to Nobody's Perfect Podcast. Today we're going to be talking about a very interesting disease state with, of long haul COVID. We have a couple of special guests here. Michael Jones is in the house with us as our guest co-host. Dr. Arturo Taka also coming in as a guest host. And then we have two people here. Uh, we have Jennifer Knight and David Gaskin. Uh, Michael, we, uh, we're having today to talk about a particular type of disease state with long-haul COVID. What do you know a little bit about it? Just what I know from people who've had it in my immediate orbit. I mean, we've got people with symptoms ranging from just the brain fog, tired, almost like depressive type of states to I can't smell or the things that I do smell are terrible and kind of the gambit in between. Well, and I think there's a lot of confusion, misconfusion about COVID in general, but this particular subcategory category of long haul COVID. I know many people in the behavioral health space question people's sanity if they're exaggerating, if it's if they're making this up. How could this really be real? Are these just people who are complainers, people who don't want to get on with their life, who are looking for attention? And I think that's something that we're going to address today. The particular state of long haul COVID that you described is something that's difficult to measure, but there is a particular category with dysregulated smell or taste that's more measurable. And we have two guests here. They're going to talk a little bit about that. Jennifer, could you please tell us a little bit about what you under, underwent with long haul COVID and particularly your, your sense of smell and taste and its dysregulation? Sure. So I got COVID July of 2020, one of the early COVID um, victims. Um, <clears throat> at first I lost taste and smell for five months, four or five months till December-ish which was actually delightful looking back on it. Um, in January, 1st of January, I started noticing um, foul smells. Actually, my first uh, experience was with a margarita. I thought somebody had washed the glass with maybe a dirty rag or something, you know? And um, things just went downhill from there. So uh, January of 2021, um, I began my journey with parosmia. I... Um, probably for about six months, went through just trying to understand it. I'm a provider myself. So I had some access to being able to look things up and investigate research myself. Uh, I ended up going to four or five other providers, a neurologist, ENT, allergist, PCP. Um, mostly at that time, nobody knew anything about it. They, again, just thought you were crazy. And, uh, oh, you know, it'll, it'll pass. It'll, you know, you're, means your olfactory nerves are damaged and they'll get better and they'll you know, get fixed, just give it some time, smell some essential oils and you'll get better. Well, it didn't get better. It got worse and worse and worse. And to the point of, um, I'm a pretty extroverted person if you didn't already know that. Um, and, but to the point that that changed, I mean, you become an introverted um, individual. And with that, you use, I went to work and I came home. That's all I did. And that can be pretty depressing. Um, PTSD is real with this um, because you never know when it's going to affect you. There are levels, different levels of it. Some people have you know, a lighter case where things just don't smell right, but they don't necessarily make you sick. Uh, the common deterrents are coffee, onions, garlic, chocolate, um, but for some people, it's just a mild distortion. For other people, and I kind of feel like I was middle of the road because there are people way worse than I was. Um, it's, you can't be around that smell. You will gag, you will throw up. There's no way to force yourself to eat something. You know, you can't eat anything hot. You take showers with nose plugs because all your products, you know, smell bad. Exhaust fumes, gas, anything, fire. I mean, it wasn't just food. It was your environment. Um, my office had to completely readjust. We couldn't make coffee in the office. We couldn't have reps come in and bring food um, or I had to leave. So it, it was pretty life-changing. Uh, my husband, who was definitely my biggest cheerleader, thank goodness, uh, was my protector. So, you know, we, we actually moved into a new house during that time. We couldn't cook. We couldn't 
Uh, I had the only things I could really eat were sweets and some carbs. So unlike other people, I actually gained weight. I probably gained 40 pounds because just to stay nourished, I would eat a donut just to stay from starving. I would eat, you know, crackers um, for months. My nighttime meal was Cheez-Its. So um, it's, it was, it got pretty bad about six or eight months in really, really bad emotionally, um, uh, really bad, like un, unimaginable. I tried everything. I, I will tell you, I tried everything. Uh, I started along with some other people, a Facebook page, and I admit, admin that Facebook page now, and now there's over what 51 or 52,000 people on it. And that Facebook page is how we actually connected with David and David, um, who certainly will tell his story, but I found him and went to him three weeks ago now, three and a half weeks ago, and had a procedure with him, which, you know, he'll talk about, and it's changed my life. It's changed my life. Um, I feel like I'm getting my life back. I'm not hundred percent, but I'm 80 to 90. And um, it's, it's brought sanity back into my life when I really didn't know if I would ever have it again. So the for, this is Dr. Taka here. Thanks for uh, uh, sharing your story. I, I got a question, you know, being a provider myself, I'm a psychiatrist. I do believe that this is a real uh, thing. Um, I have seen it in my own patients uh, complaining of brain fog, depression, you know, vegetative symptoms of depression, um, fatigue, um, you know, various amount of neurological things, um, lung issues, um, endocrine things. For, for you, um, can you tell me or can you tell us about uh, your, your actual, the, the symptoms of COVID you had and when, when, when did you have the long term or long haul? When did that start um, uh, becoming an, an, an issue? Was your, was your uh, actual COVID period when you were sick with it, was it, was it severe? Um, and was it, if you don't mind me asking, do you, do you think it's probably, it was probably during the time of Delta? It was definitely during the time of Delta, um, which is, I'm sure the strain, I feel pretty sure that's the strain I had. I had two weeks of a pretty severe case. Um, my PCP wanted me to go in the hospital twice and I refused, um, mainly because there was nothing they could do for me except oxygen. And at that point, I just felt like if I need that, I'll go do that. Um, so I had a pretty severe case and I lost taste and smell within five days. During that five months that I, mentioned that I didn't have taste and smell. The physical part of me was um, severe tachycardia, PVCs, um, shortness of breath was way severe, low oxygen, probably around 88 to 90 on an average day. The fatigue was enormous. Um, I kept working, but it was tough. Um, the migraines were pretty severe. The um, brain fog, which actually really lasted up until my procedure with David, uh, and it's slowly getting better, but um, it was pretty severe too. So I do feel like I had a pretty severe case, not bad enough that I it got admitted. I, they just, you know, providers are not very compliant, and I just was not going to go back in the, go in the hospital if I didn't have to. My husband got it at the same time, and he had a pretty severe case. We actually contracted it at my mother's funeral. And so about 12 to 13 people got it. And he had a pretty oh. severe case too, just not as bad. And um, so we just kind of hung together for a couple of weeks, the long haulers, the um, tachycardia, all that kind of stuff kind of resolved about four months in. I did the halter monitor echo, I did the whole everything. And um, it just resolved about four months in. And then um, about a month after that is when this nightmare started and the brain fog, the fatigue, which I'm not sure how much of the fatigue was related to depression and anxiety as well, probably both um, remained for sure. When you mean brain fog, because there's many people have complained about that. What, what was that like? Ugh, you know, and when you're a provider and you can't remember the name of a medicine that you prescribed a thousand times, that kind of brain fog. I mean, it's there, it's in your head, but you can't verbalize it. Um, it's that kind of brain fog. It's, it's not, um, it's probably like what somebody with dementia would feel like, like they know what they want to say, but they can't get it out. 
that's how one of my patients describes it um, exactly. Uh, and she's a nurse as well, uh, working, but she has trouble spelling and getting words out. Yeah. So I would do like Sudoku. I was a Wordle freak, you know, when it came out, you know, anything to churn that brain to um, keep me going. And like I said, you know, three and a half weeks ago when I, um, you know, met with David and had that procedure done, it didn't help it immediately, but I do notice daily that that brain fog is better. Um, it, and I don't know how much of that is because you are subconsciously thinking about what's the next smell, what's the next, or is it true brain fog long haulers? I, I can't answer that part, but it's there. David so Gaskin. You had COVID. Oh, go ahead. Oh, well, I was just gonna, I was just gonna introduce David from Republic Pain Specialist. David Gaskin, you've had many patients also who have similar symptoms as what she just described. True. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, over two hundred and fifty now. And you have, um, you're a pain specialist in in the Texas area, right outside of College Station. And what's your typical, what's your typical patient that, that you see? And how did that change during COVID? Oh, well, I mean, I'm a pain guy. So typically it's a chronic pain issues. Um, I, I did anesthesia for 22 years prior to getting into pain. So I have a, a pretty vigorous practice with um, post-surgical pain, um, even uh, doing radio frequencies prior to surgeries to uh, you know, prevent post-op pain for a long time. So I, I typically just saw pain patients. Um, uh, parosmia uh, was not uh, <laughs> was not on my radar by by any means uh, uh, before November of, of twenty one. And you you came across parosmia? How did you just have a, a number of patients who had long haul COVID, or what 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 was the connection for you? <laughs> Well, I, there was a, uh, a case study, um, a, a Dr. Lou, Luke Lou out of uh, Alaska, uh, published a, a study in the Journal of Im Neuroimmunology uh, in uh, early November of 21 on a case study of two patients. He did a, a stellate ganglion block, cervical sympathetic blockade, uh, and restored their smell and taste. Uh, just a case study on two patients, and I, it was I, I read it. It came across my news feed, and um, I happened to be teaching a course. I've got another business, Maverick Medical Education. We teach continuing education, uh, ultrasound guidance for different pain procedures, even acute pain regional blocks. So we were teaching a course in Fort Worth that very weekend, and I was just making small talk with some of the other instructors when we were. Uh, getting set up and um, said, did y'all hear about that that doctor that did a stellate ganglion block and restored people's smell and taste? And no one had, but one of the other instructors said, do it on me. I've got parosmia. And I go, well, you're kidding. And he goes, I've had it for nine months. He said, I've lost 30 pounds. He goes, I, I, I can't eat or drink anything. He said, do it for me right now. And um, Students were actually showing up, so we had to wait till lunch, and all the students went to lunch. Um, mm -hmm. I laid him down and did a right-sided stellate ganglion block, and uh, in five minutes, he had, as he reported, 95% of his smell and taste back. Um, he was on uh, Jennifer's Facebook page. He was a member of that support group for Prosmia and um, started started posting about his, um, you know, kind of recovery and. People started asking why and how, and um, a few people started coming down to me, and I, I think it uh, just went crazy off of Facebook, <laughs> to be honest with you. And uh, it's you know, it's got to where I, I do about anywhere from fifteen to uh, twenty stellate ganglions a day now. Wow, that's amazing, uh, David. Can you? Do you know how Dr. Lou made the connection? I, I'm assuming he does this for uh, the traditional, um, uh, pain uh, issues. Absolutely. Yeah. He, he's a pain provider in, uh, in Alaska, but he doesn't say in his, in his article, uh, whether he was doing it 
for a pain procedure and he just happened to see that they got their smell and taste back. Um, but he does definitely go into, you know, the pathophysiology of, of why he felt like it was going to work, why he thought it worked. Um, and, uh, but he doesn't say why. Um, it's, I think that's very interesting. I'd love to speak with him and ask him um, if he happenstance found it or if he was smart enough to understand, you know, uh, autonomic dysfunction and, and that it could affect smell and taste. Well, what do you think is going on? What, what do you think, first of all, causes uh, this particular uh, situation? And why do you think um, the stellate uh, ganglion block reduces uh, some of the symptoms? Well, uh, you know, Dr. Taka, after 250 patients or so, uh, roughly there, I, I lose count during the week. Um, usually try to catch up and find the numbers on weekends, but um, somewhere as close to 250 patients. And I've had less than 30 that did not get uh, greater than 50% relief. Um, when you see 220 in a row, um, you know, uh, 10 or 15 a day, breaking down in tears um, five minutes after the injection, there's no doubt in my mind anyway, um, that it's an autonomic dysfunction. So uh, when we do a sympathetic nerve block, um, block, uh, do a sympathectomy of the cervical ganglion and, and allow them to reset, then it, it corrects all of these long COVID symptoms and not just their smell and taste. Um, you know, I've had a, a nurse come to me that was having a, a heart rate of 150. She couldn't go back to work. She couldn't work. Um, she couldn't stand up without passing out. Uh, couldn't take care of her kids. She'd been through every cardiac workup, uh, wore a halter monitor. They um, uh, they, they couldn't find anything wrong with her. Um, her husband brought her to me, said, could it be long COVID? I go, I don't know. She did not have any prosthesis. Her, her uh, tachycardia was her only issue. And um, I said, well, it's, it's worth a try. And um, I did a stellate ganglion. She's never had tachycardia since. Um, it completely went away. Um, tinnitus, ringing in the ears, uh, goes away. Um, postural hypotension, orthostatic hypotension goes away. Um, chronic fatigue goes away. Um, <laughs> it's it's uh, Raynaud's uh, coldness, hands, feet goes away. Um, you, you know, all these things, it's not just smell and taste. Uh, all of these long haul symptoms um, are just dissipate at least to a degree, uh, maybe not completely, but to a degree, um, when we do a very short-term block of the sympathetic ganglion. So, um, you know, a, a five, 10 minute block cannot produce weeks or months of, of uh, relief. You know, that first guy that got 95% relief, that was November 4th. He's nine months in, he's still 100%, close to 100%. Um, how can a 10 minute block produce a, a nine month effect? Um, you know, if it's not allowing the body to do a reset and a re recalibration and, and uh, uh, auto regulation, that's what for I the think. viewer, <clears throat> for the viewers at, and listeners, can we just do a basic explain the autonomic nervous system and what its role is and how it's affected, how it should be normally affected during a disease like COVID nineteen? Could you do that for us, David? I, I'll try. I'm not a I'm certainly not a scientist, not a neuroscientist, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best from my understanding of it. Um, you know, the first thing we need to know is that your central nervous system is your brain and spinal cord. Um, everything outside of that central nervous system is our peripheral nervous system. Um, that's composed of your, your autonomic nervous system. Uh, we call it autonomic because, you know, for, throughout the history of medical science, we believe that we could not um, regulated. We could not affect it consciously. We couldn't think uh, of our heart and slow our heart rate down. You know, we couldn't think of, of, you know, constricting our vascular, you know, arterial system and increasing our blood pressure. Um, and so within that autonomic system, everything outside of the central nervous system is uh, two systems. And we break that up into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, these two systems basically innervate our musculature or 
our vessels, our nerves, our, uh, our organs, uh, our glands, hormones, uh, neurotransmitters, vasculature, everything else. Um, and they operate reflexively in opposite of each other. So the sympathetic is our fight or flight. It's our protective mechanism. So if the body senses a danger, then we immediately initiate a fight or flight, a sympathetic um, response in our body. Everything from constricting our vasculature and our legs and shunting blood to the, to the major organs of the chest. Um, it will increase our heart rate. It will increase our respiratory rate. Um, it will uh, uh, dilate our pupils, uh, make us hyper alert and hyper awake. Um, our adrenal glands will release epinephrine, adrenaline, um, to give us energy uh, to, to expand that uh, oxygen that we need to get away from whatever danger is there, uh, or to fight a virus like COVID. So, but reflexively, when sympathetic innervation is, is high, then that reflexively pushes parasympathetic innervation low. And uh, parasympathetic is all the opposites of are sympathetic. So the rest and digest system, when parasympathetic is innervated, we get drowsy, we get sleepy, it's time to go to bed. Um, our gut kicks in, we, uh, the parasympathetic innervation is, is the entric system. So our, our uh, GI tract. So, um, you, you know, I, I give an analogy, if, if you're walking down the woods and a, and a bear jumps out, going to eat you, um, you are in full blown sympathetic drive. Um, you are in fight or flight, okay? Um, all those things we just talked about, I just said, happen. You will certainly never need to stop and take a poop um, when the bear's chasing. That's parasympathetic, okay? So, you know, you'll, you'll never feel drowsy and want to lay down and take a nap with a bear chasing, right? So um, if, if we understand that these, they cannot work together, they can only work reflexively in opposite of each other. So what happened when we catch COVID is our body detected a uh, threat to our ourselves, our, our being. Um, that initiated an immune response. This immune response, our natural immune response is a um, inflammatory reaction. So we initiated an inflammatory response systemic wide that kicked off a higher sympathetic innervation with the rest of our body. So now we're in, the, in a positive feedback loop that every um, component elicits more reaction from the next side. Does that make sense? So a higher sympathetic flow initiates a higher and a, and a greater immune response. A greater immune response elicits a, a greater inflammatory response. That inflammatory response triggers greater sympathetic and we just keep this this going until the body reevaluates, realizes we're um, lo no longer in danger and it's supposed to break that cycle and come back to regulation, auto regulation. For some reason, this dysautonomia or, or dysfunction of the autonomic nervous system is essentially a, an overreacting of this, this positive feedback loop between the nervous system, the immune system, and then this inflammatory cascade uh, that's involved. So it, the stellate ganglion works because each of those systems are interdependent of each other, but one is just feeding the other and, and causing that. If we can do a real short-term um, block, interruption of any one of those, then we block, block the whole loop and, and allow the body to uh, through auto-regulation, reorganize itself and, and return to normal. Simple as that. Jen, Jen, that. That's a fantastic description. Jennifer, did you have this done in a, in, in under anesthesia? Did you go into a clinic? Tell, tell us about the experience. Um, I went to David's clinic. Um, actually, I that my husband and I drove. My husband's name is David as well. We uh, live in the Florida Panhandle, so we are a good bit away from David. <laughs> over in College Station, but we drove over there and went to his office at nine o'clock the next morning, had the first one done in the right side. Within 
gosh, five or 10 minutes, I was in tears eating a Reese cup. Um, I mean, it's, it was crazy. It was, I don't even know how to describe it. It was crazy. And so then David generally will do them, um, you know, for people that live far away, he'll do them in the same day, but not one right after the other. And so he said, go get some lunch, go, you know, and then come back around two or three, and then we'll do the other side if we think we need it. Well, I was like, you, give me everything you got. So we went and I ate lunch and I ate things I've not eaten in a year and a half. And this was right after I had it. I sat at a table with my husband drinking coffee, which he hasn't been able to, had not been able to do for 18 months. It was painless. It really was. It was a little pressure. It's ultrasound guided. David's very gentle. He's got a, a wonderful assistant that is um, very comforting. And it, the actual injection took, what, three minutes, David, if that. Um, the second one, I came back around two. I ain't gonna lie, that one caused a little bit of pain. I don't know what he was thinking, but uh, uh, but it was doable. Now I have seen on our Facebook page where some people have done, taken anesthesia, maybe taken PO anesthesia, or, or some of them have actually gone under, but for me, it was not necessary. I was like, bring on the pain, do it, do it, do it. And it's so quick. Um, and if you've got the right person, do it under, doing it under ultrasound, both times it, it took less than five minutes. What'd you have for lunch? I had um, sweet potatoes with avocado on it and egg on it, which all of the above I'd not been able to eat with bacon on it and a um, Bloody Mary, not even going to lie, had not had that in a year and a half. And then, like I said, my husband was able to have coffee and he had his Bloody Mary as well. That night after the second one, we went to eat Mexican and I sat in the actual restaurant. I will, I won't lie for, for lunch. I sat, we sat outside cause I still was a little nervous, but um, we sat in the Mexican restaurant, not even far from the kitchen. The plate I had was ridiculous. David, I can't remember the name of that restaurant I went to that was awesome over in College Station. You go to Chewy's? Yes, Chewy's. That's where we went. Chewy's. Uh, um, had a couple of margaritas, which, as I said before, that was kind of my the start of my nightmare was a margarita. And um, two or three different Mexican things. And it um, had a bottle of wine. Well, okay, a glass. We better put a glass. <laughs> uh, wine that night, which I haven't had in a year and a half. So, I mean, it was, it was pretty life-changing. I spent a lot of tears, a lot of happy tears that day and night and have since. So, um, you know, this disease, and, and that's what it is, post-COVID, which, you know, as a provider, I get so aggravated when people say, oh, it's just a cold. And I'm like, you know, we don't know long-term what this COVID's doing. And I know long-term what it did to me. And it was utterly life-changing for me to have this. And now, you know, with the help of, help of David willing to go out on a limb and say, hey, let me do this guy in this office while I'm teaching class, you know, it's life-changing. What is, uh, since that time, it's been three weeks, is the other, are the other symptoms that you had, the brain fog is, you mentioned PTSD. And I know earlier we had talked, there was a great deal of PTSD or anxiety that you expressed. Yeah. And I think you had it right before Easter, if I'm correct, or somewhere around there. And you had you wondered, hey, I wonder how long this is going to last. Or can you talk a little bit about that? So, you know, the PTSD, it's not going to go away um, immediately. Every day is better with that. But there's still, I'll give you an example. My sweet, um, devoted husband made um, something in the oven Saturday for the grandchildren. And it fell in the bottom of the oven and it burned. Well, I told you I'm 85 to 90%. I'm not 100 and anything burnt is still terrible. Well, he, he didn't tell me. I think he just kind of forgot. And I'm in the bedroom and I said, what the, oh, I don't know what I can say on here, but what the heck? And um, sure enough, that was a PTSD moment. It, was, it, all, it brought it all back. It, was, it immediately brought it all back. And I had to go outside and I mean, it was pretty strong and you know, I know there are going to be those moments for a while, but they're few and far between. As far as the last three weeks, 
I have been in restaurants. We've had reps in the office. They're able to make coffee in the office. The smell of coffee, garlic, onions, chicken is still there. It's just almost dulled, if that makes any sense. Like the COVID smell, as we call it on our Facebook page, is still there, but it's dull. And everybody describes the smell differently. My most accurate description of the smell is um, like, like rotten flesh sitting in front of a paper mill with that sulfur smell around it as well. That's my smell for everything that has the smell. So um, eggs, I did try eggs the other day, that's still a no. So there are some no's, but there are more yeses now. The PTSD, I'm still very careful. I'm still very um, uh, systematic on the things that I try. And, um, but even before all this, I mean, I, I was a vegetarian. I was very healthy eating. I, um, you know, but then this, changes all of that. So now I'm kind of trying to go back into that, knowing that I'm celebrating what I can eat as well. But, you know, I want to say too, I want it to be very upfront about the fact that be, because I see this a lot on our Facebook page, it's not just about eating. This is about socialization. Also, it's about my husband's an Episcopal priest. I couldn't go to coffee hour. We did um, a potluck. I couldn't go in that room. Um, it's it's the social aspect of this as well that is is destroying, and it's mentally mentally taxing. So it's yeah, not. I was going to ask you, how did it get in the way in, in your life, daily life? And you 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 started talking about, uh, you know, it affected you mentally, and uh, you you described before you didn't know if you know you were you had depression or anxiety. Um, Kind of explain how, how your symptoms really affected your daily life. So I, you know, I'm, I was not, I've never had depression or anxiety before. So, you know, that all that was new to me. Um, I'll give you kind of an example. Thanksgiving, we have five grandchildren, three children that are married to wonderful uh, spouses. They all came Thanksgiving. Um, I had to spend all of Thanksgiving outside the whole day. 10 to 12 hours outside because of the cooking, because of the, I couldn't eat, I couldn't, you know, I was just happy they were here, but that's pretty crazy to have to stay outside. Thank God it was a beautiful day, but that's, that's crazy. And I've lost, I'm not, I've lost friends over it. You know, people just don't believe you. They don't think it's as bad as it is. Oh, suck it up. You can go in this restaurant. Oh, you can, you know, you can come have a, cup of coffee with me or, you know, whatever. They don't believe it's as bad as it is when you will smell something and walk out the door and throw your guts up. Um, and so it's very isolating. And that's where the Facebook group actually came into play for me and a lot of people was they understood. 52,000 people understand that what you're going through. And so you can get on there and, and spill your guts and not be crazy. Um, but socially, it was very isolating. And like I said, I have a very supportive husband who um, got me through it along with David Gaskin. But um, it, it's probably about eight months in was my lowest point. Um, my husband was gone for three or four days and it was, I didn't get out of bed. I didn't eat. I didn't sleep. I didn't it was my lowest point. And it was after that, I knew I had to pull my big girl pants on and take charge of my life. And um, that's when I decided to call David and say, all right, I'm ready, let's do it. You know, and I literally, I think I made the appointment on Tuesday and we drove on Wednesday or Thursday. You, so it sounds like you were developing some depression because of, of this. No doubt. I hadn't. <sighs> I'm not even sure how much of it I can go into, but I had major depression. Mm -hmm. By the time I called David, I'd never experienced depression before. I had major depression, mm -hmm. major, not minor. So, did, did, did you notice after you got a series of, of treatments, did you, did you feel that depression uh, got better or did you just feel better that the symptoms were resolving? And the reason uh, I ask is a technical one, but I can tell you, I'll, I'll ask uh, 
David, late a, after you answer. Do you think your the depression itself lifted after some treatments? Um, I do think it lifted. It's not gone. I'm not. I'm going to be honest with you. It's not gone because you don't recover from that overnight. Um, the PTSD is not gone, and there are times when I mourn what I missed that year and a half. Um, and so, but I, what I've been able to do and achieve in the last three weeks overrides that. And so I can kind of bring myself back because I do feel like I'm otherwise mentally healthy, except for that time and that, um, issue, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I don't think it's a hundred percent gone, but I'm in a place, I'm in a much better place where, um, I don't think that any, um, mm -hmm. I don't think any action on the depression would take place. Okay. And, and the reason why I, I ask is I, I'm, I'm very interested in, in this, uh, uh, I don't know if you want to call it technology, but this, uh, the nervous system that we're kind of tapping into, uh, uh, we, we, we have some experience with uh, developing some, some stimulators that take advantage of uh, the, you know, the cranial nerves. And we've done some work in the, the field of addiction, uh, tapping into the vagus nerve and the other cranial nerves, uh, achieving an effect for opiate uh, withdrawal symptoms. And so what I know about the stellate ganglion, I don't know much, that's too, that's above my pay grade, but what I understand, it's a chain of, of nerves that, that travel through the neck and then affects different organs. And we talk about the autonomic nervous system controlling the automatic um, uh, effects of our organs, and we do it unconsciously. And if, it's, if the seesaw is tipped one way or the other, you can have uh, certain problems. Um, and what I know is the, 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 big, the, the, the biggest nerve that affects the autonomic nervous system is the cranial nerve number, number 10, the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is, I believe, part of the stellate ganglion. And uh, one, one thing that we have in, in neurology and psychiatry is we, we, we have a device that, that, uh, that stimulates the vagus nerve through an incision here in the, in the front of the neck accessing the... the the, the cervical uh, chain of the vagus nerve, and that's uh, been used to for for uh, seizure disorder or epilepsy and depression, and th that's why I I, I ask uh, because we we know that the vagus nerve is very very important has a lot of uh, functions, but in in our uh, in in our neighborhood the, the vagus nerve is very important for mood seizures and uh, involved in the hyper, you know, hyper sympathetic, uh, state. So, um, I, I'm just, I'm just talking out loud. Um, David, what, what are your thoughts about, you know, we, we talk about this long haul COVID being a, a, um, an autoimmune response, a hyper, uh, hyperactive, uh, sympathetic response, um, that involves cytokines and inflammation did, did you ever talk to anybody about using this, not in long haul, but in an acute state of COVID, for, for example, perhaps in, in, um, uh, during the cytokine storm itself? There were actually a, a study done and they did uh, bilateral stellate ganglions uh, twice a day for two weeks on, on uh, intubated patients in, in uh, ARDS uh, from, from COVID. And mm -hmm. they found that they actually uh, recovered faster and, and were survival uh, for the most wow. part. Yeah, they, they could block that cytokine storm, block that hyperinflammatory response in the lungs and uh, blunt it at least or, or uh, affect it enough that uh, the patients, uh, the majority, I don't remember all the statistics, but the majority of them actually survived. So they were promoting a very quick, early use of the stellate to block this inflammatory response. Um, you know, if, if, if the theory or the, the hypothesis that this autonomic dysfunction, this hyperinflammatory overreacting sympathetic system can be manipulated with, and, and reset with a stellate ganglion injection, um, how much can we affect 
rheumatoid arthritis, um, depression, major depression, anxiety disorders, um, um, Crohn's disease, um, lupus, um, Parkinson's, uh, all of these um, autoimmune diseases, um, I, I, I don't know where it would stop. You know, um, I personally used it on for depression, pain, um, PTSD, and it works for all of them. Um, I've got one patient that I would do stellate ganglions about every three weeks. Uh, we finally just got tired of doing them after seven or eight um, every two weeks. He had major anxieties, PTSD, depressions, and, and I did a uh, pulsed radio frequency up, and he gets about 10 months at a time relief. Um, so would that work for, I have rheumatoid arthritis. W would that help me relieve my uh, rheumatoid arthritis symptoms? Would that help fibromyalgia? Would that, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I hope, and we obviously, I think, need a lot of research done on this, um, uh, controlled studies where we could really, you know, separate it out and look at it. But um, there's more here than I think we give credit to what the stellate can do. And you're exactly right. What I, I mean, I, when you said the, the vagus nerve, you're trying, am I right, Dr. Tucker? You're trying to stimulate vagus, right? Right. What, yeah. what happens yeah. when I block stellate? When I block sympathetic, reflexively, it shoots a, a reflexive um, parasympathetic or vagal stimulation. So I'm kind of doing the same thing as you, but I'm targeting the, the, uh, the sympathetic side of it. Instead of trying to stimulate vagus, I'm blocking sympathetic, which in reflexive, reflexively, the body's going to have a, a, a reflex vagal stimulation. So um, you're, you're blocking one arm of the uh, autonomic system. So the vagus nerve exactly. for listeners, there's yeah. a, there's an a, uh, uh, F, uh, afferent and efferent. Uh, afferent, yeah. efferent, correct, correct. Right. And um, you were blocking the efferent, is that efferent. right? Efferent, efferent, sympathetic. Yeah. Efferent. Okay, okay, okay. That I mean, makes, is there, uh, is there, I'm sorry, is there a reason why you went on the right side with Jennifer? It is or, or I was taught in fellowship. I, I was taught in fellowship that that we humans, we we humans are ninety five percent sympathetic, dominated with a uh, right side, um, and it gets really deep into you know the innervation into the uh, cortex and and uh, thalamus and hypothalamus and whatnot. But um, but we were always treating for like I said, PTSD or complex regional pain. I, and so I, we always started with the right. I rarely have done a left-sided stellate ganglion um, until we started treating for prosmia. Uh, and I have since found after 250 patients that it's not 95%. Uh, it may be 70%, but it's not 95% by any means. Um, I, I have done multiple patients and that, that I did a right-sided block, got almost zero response, do a left-sided block and they go to close to 100%, multiple patients. And, um, you know, and, and all my staff agrees that it's, it's probably a good 25 or 30%. Um, Is that your quote unquote standard of care for these patients to do bilateral blocks? Not for local patients. Um, for local patients that are, you know, within a, a reasonable driving distance, I recommend a right-sided block, and then I, I recommend them wait two weeks. Um, you know, just like Jennifer, they're going to keep seeing um, improvements for several weeks, and, and I want them to wait and see how good they can get, um, especially if they can, you know, come back in a, in a week or two without too much expense. When someone comes from Canada or Israel, um, I've got uh, a lady coming from Germany next week. Uh, they just, they, they typically just can't come uh, and, and stay for two weeks, you know, so they, uh, they're trying to get as much as they can done. Um, Dr. Lou in his uh, report and his, his case study did them on, on back to back days. And um, so I'm just mimicking what Dr. Lou did, seeing if I could get the same results and and so I'm, I'm okay to do them on the same day, uh, two hours apart, or, or if, if they're able to at least 
I prefer the next day. Um, you know, do one one day, one the next. Sure. I can tell you, John, the reason why we do the vagus nerve uh, stimulation on the left side uh, is to avoid some of the cardiac issues. They may uh, become bradycardic, and perhaps that's uh, something uh, that's a desired effect you, you want in, in, in maybe a tachycardic post-COVID uh, patient. Um, but that's the reason why we do it on the left side. Uh, there's more innervation from the right um, uh, ganglion to, to the heart as far as uh, the sympathetic uh, innervation. Can you, thank you, Dr. Taka, and, and thank you, David, too. Can you talk, uh, Jennifer, about some of the people that you've come across in the Facebook group? I've been in there a few weeks. Uh, my sister, uh, Kathleen, found it. And it's heartwarming, but also heartbreaking at the same time to see the victories. Um, would you would you talk just a little bit about that, maybe, Jennifer? Sure. Um, it's probably one of the most supportive Facebook pages you'll ever find. Um, there's only about five of us admins that that regulate conversation, and obviously daily we're we're monitoring any um, negativity. But for the most part, the people in that page are hurting. They are desperate. I mean, if you go back to the beginning of that page, which um, Megan Weinstein, I think that's how you say her last name, is that the actual founder, and you go back to the original's first starting date and all the things that people have tried up into David, and there's a new thing that's um, this little hormone pill, but people are, are desperate. They're desperate. They will try anything, and I was there. I was there. I was trying anything I could try. I did. There's a flick method. There's a burnt orange method. There's, you know, there's, there's crazy stuff that people are desperate. And I will also say that we've talked people off the ledge before we have. And, you know, I've spent hours and hours and hours searching for somebody that said, I'm going to kill myself and left the page. And, um, you know, then you search for them and find them and bring them back. And the page is, you know, the, the people on the page are supportive and we have all levels. We have people that just, like I explained earlier, have the mild distortion and it's a pain, but it's livable to nose. Uh, I mean, um, NG tubes and being in the hospital, um, anorexia, and, and even the stories of people having to go in the hospital are really sad because the staff doesn't understand it. They think it's just regular anorexia. They think it's just, you know, eat. I just need you to eat. Hello, we can't eat. You don't understand. It tastes like death. But they think that it's um, an overreaction. And then you get out of the hospital after something like that, and you literally want to end your life. And that's what we're dealing with on that page. It's it's pretty, um, pretty crazy what uh, this mess has done to people um that's so, why so tell me jennifer you, you got an immediate response it sounds like and, and you you say that you're oh not 100 uh 70 80 percent so how how long does the effect last and where are you at now are you are you getting regular treatments or what's what's your uh you know what's the what's the plan i guess we're treading new waters here but what do you think what, what do you think um, lies ahead for you and people who are suffering uh, like yourself? So for me, um, I mean, I don't live next door to David. So if I need another shot, I will get in my car and go get it from him. I won't go to anybody else. I do live day to day in fear. Again, that's probably where that PTSD comes in. And I was telling David actually before you guys got on, um, that, you know, it, it's, a, I, sometimes I don't want to move my head the wrong way. Sometimes I don't want to, you know, um, uh, being a, you know, I'm scared about being in a car wreck. It might, you know, it's crazy stuff thinking that this will reverse it. I'm due for my, my booster for COVID and I'm scared to get it. And I'm a huge vaccine advocate and I'm, I'm scared to get it. I just don't want any change. I'm scared. I work in peds and I see COVID now again, the numbers are going back up. I see it. And I'm scared to death of getting it again, because if I get this again, you know, what do you do? However, I really feel very positive that um, uh, what 
treatment I got is enough to get me to the end, to get me back to 100%. David is um, not one of these people, not one of these providers that will shoot you up and let you go. So, you know, he has come up with a plan and, and, and partnered with somebody that will work with you on, you know, making sure that the stress part, the PTSD part, the anxiety part is kind of um, taken care of because it's been a year and a half of being in a constant stressful state and you have to learn how to uh, uh, wash that stress out of your life somehow, whether it's meditation, breathing techniques, you know, whatever it is. Um, and that's where I'm going with it. You know, I'm going, I'm proactive with making sure that the stress that's in my life, aside from this, is minimized and um, regulated for me. So I, I don't anticipate having to have another um, uh, round of injections, but if I do, I will. And, and how many have you had so far? I just had that two injections that two. one day. Okay. That one day, three, um, three weeks ago, three in a couple of days. Mm -hmm. weeks ago. And um, David, what, what's your, what, what do you see uh, how, on average? Do you think uh, how many people or how many on average do people need uh, to regain? It sounds like functionality um, because um, when you're, when you're having like I said, you over 250 patients, I've only, uh, done more than two blocks on a uh, dozen people. Mm -hmm. uh, we do we do the two. Some of them only get one out of the two hundred and fifty something people. I've done about three hundred and thirty cell games. So um, not everybody gets two blocks. You know, some people um, do great with just the right side, um, close to one hundred percent, and they they're happy with that. And I tell them, you know, go go live your life. And um, you know, I don't. Um, I'll say this, Dr. Doctor, Dr., that out of those 250 some odd patients, um, I don't believe there's one that would uh, characterize themselves as a laid back, quiet, um, stoic uh, introvert. <laughs> they they are all um, that a type A. Um, uh, person, maybe, you know, wound tight, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, or to, if you want to go to a, a further extent, they have been diagnosed with major depressive disorders, um, anxieties and panic attacks, mm -hmm. um, or even further PTSD in their so life. So you're, you're, you're recognizing a pattern. Uh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Day look yeah, like they, they're uh, at risk for it. They, you know what? I was, I was thinking about this a few minutes ago, John, what in our population, the, the, one of the first things we do when people come to see us for addictive disorders is we do genetic testing. And I am just curious um, if we did the genetic testing, if there is a commonality and it sounds like there may be as far as mood disorder or anxiety or even a hyper, uh, uh, you know, ADD. Adrenergic, yeah, yeah. A, a hyper adrenergic state. Yes. You know, uh, um, you know, uh, Tracy raising her hand there. <laughs> uh, I mean, they, they, they all, uh, I don't have to ask them. They'll tell me, you know, uh, they, they, um, it was, it was obvious after the first hundred patients, you know, these are all the same person. They just shape different, look different, you know, mm -hmm. um, they, you know, some are worse than others. Some, um, have had, you know, PTSD since childhood abuses, or, um, you know, they've suffered from, you know, bipolar and anxieties and depressions and under medication and treatment for it. Um, but not, uh, the average one all have, you know, just, I'm, I'm just a wound tight. I'm the warrior of the family. I just, mm -hmm. I just worry all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's just that way. And, um, so there's, there's, there's just not one, not one that, that doesn't describe themselves like that. That's interesting. Cause yeah. we usually, uh, describe people in terms of hardware and software. Mm -hmm. And so some people are, you know, have personalities that's kind of software, how they're kind of uh, programmed. But you're you're suggesting perhaps people who have a personality, it may be hardware. 
it, it may be, uh, you know, this, uh, some, some kind of neurological kind of commonality that people are, you know, a little bit, uh, uh, you know, a little, uh, as you put it, uh, a little wow, uh, high strung, or like I, I described these uh, people have a hyper adrenergic tone yeah. where, you know, they're just kind of a little awake, a little, um, um, uh, they don't alert. sleep much. Yeah. They, they just yeah. don't sleep much. They're, yeah. they're, you know, they, but guess all of that is, is a high sympathetic tone. That's you correct. Know, that's a yeah. hyper, you know, a hyper reaction, a hyper, mm -hmm. um, adrenergic, you know, uh, input. Is that genetic? I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I'm probably not that I'm not smart enough to figure that out probably, but there's something, uh, at least very common denominator there mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm of a hundred odd million people that got COVID, um, these people are the ones that are getting this autonomic dysfunction, this uh, dysautonomia. Mm -hmm. um, they already had a high set point of that, of, of that sympathetic innervation um, and COVID just uh, really threw it, you know, interesting. The interesting. And that, that's why we, we, you know, respect the vagus nerve in, in depression um, because it, it, uh, turns the, uh, the sympathetic, it flips it over to parasympathetic right. people right. can kind of calm down and not be so, uh, uh, you know, I guess, uh, revved up. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there is something to this. I, I do believe it's almost sounds too good to be true, but re really, you know, I always refer, uh, to the vagus nerve as the master switch of, of the body. It really does. It turns things on and off. Um, if you need to run faster, you turn it on, you got to relax, you turn it off. Um, and every human or not human, but every organism has a, uh, uh, well-evolved autonomic nervous system. And, um, um, we, we, we need that. We need the sympathetic and parasympathetic to, to, to survive, you know? So, um, just unbelievable. Now you, you, it sounds like you have enough cases, uh, David, that, are you planning to publish your, your, uh, your findings um, or how many people like yourself are doing it? I, I guess Dr. Lou is the godfather of this, <laughs> this procedure, but um, it sounds like you were one of the, one, one of the early, uh, um, you know, innovators of, of this procedure for this space. I, I don't, what are yeah, you going to do with this, uh, this experience? I, well, I, I do feel a big obligation to uh, publish this, you know, it's however reason the little, uh, nurse in Texas got, uh, you know, got tagged with being the guy on Facebook. Um, you know, that I feel a responsibility to, to try to get that information out to more providers. Um, and so I am involved with Texas Christian University, TCU in Fort Worth. I'm associate faculty for their advanced pain management fellowship. Um, and so I, I, uh, I'm working with TCU. I'm basically doing the work. Um, they're doing the data mining, uh, sending out uh, self-reported uh, uh, questionnaires so all the patients can report their um, experiences after the right-sided block, after left-sided block. Um, did they have any negative effects? Um, uh, did they have any other positive effects? Did it affect, you know, their heart rate, their sleep, their uh, fatigue, their brain fog, you know, all these other factors. Um, and so we, uh, we're going to do a, uh, we almost completed a pilot study on 10 patients that we sent for ENT workup to absolutely confirm they had no, um, you know, sinus issues, no uh, olfactory bulb issues that would be affecting their their smell, um, and then brought them to me and did my stellate ganglion. We're going to do basically a pilot study of ten, uh, and then do a more longitudinal study on uh, ongoing on on the the bigger numbers um, of of what I'm doing. So hopefully we can get that out. David, that's fantastic. Will you will you be able to incorporate a little bit of maybe some um, any sort of psychiatric or psychological testing on those patients, a PHQ nine or anything like that? Oh, I'd, I'd love there? to. I just uh, you know we're um, I'm just overwhelmed, overwhelmed almost. You know, I'm I'm serious. I'm I'm here in the office at. 545, 6 a.m., you know, I'll, I'll leave sometime tonight after 9, 930, you know, um, that's almost every day. And it's, um, we, and that's where I hope people will, these academic settings will, will get on board and, and you know, uh, where they've got the manpower to really do some of that. I, I would like to do genetic testing, I, that, you know, Dr. Tucker, I, 
there, I, I took care of a mom and both daughters. Um, and the daughter had such an autonomic dysfunction that if she stood up, she'd pass out. Mm -hmm. uh, couldn't speak, almost stroke-like symptoms. Uh, you know, it, it was very obvious to me, there's got to be some sort of, everyone in the family got COVID. The two, the two sons and the, and the father didn't get parosmia. Mm -hmm. The mother and the two daughters, um, you know, got this really bad uh, autonomic dysfunction. Um, Still, like ganglion helped them all, but there's got to be a genetic component at yeah. least to it. Yeah. Uh, I want to share my experience. You know, there's a uh, a signal that we commonly look for in in, in our practice. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of MTHFR. Um, it's it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's 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 historically linked to lots of things of uh, problems in uh, childbirth or neural tube defects and things like that. But we we know that uh, it's also associated with uh, some depression. Um, it's a pro it's a very common uh, deficiency, and most people who have it don't have any problems. But uh, it's about thirty percent of the general population. But in my psychiatric and addiction practice, it pushes uh, close to ninety percent. Wow. And uh, so we identify this, we treat it with essentially MTHFR deficiency. You can't you can't uh, metabolize um, folic acid correctly, and you don't have the usable form of folic acid. And uh, when you don't have folic acid, you can have problems with neural, uh, neural tube defects. And that's why we give a lot of folic acid to pregnant women, right? So we try to avoid this stuff. But it, this is got, it's got its fingers everywhere because that, that uh, active form of folic acid is involved in DNA, right? The, the DNA needs uh, uh, you know, uh, power supply to do what it's supposed to do. And if it doesn't have enough, you can have a lot of problems, including a synthesis of neurotransmitters. Um, it's also um, ironically associated with uh, uh, inflammation. So uh, DVTs, MIs, uh, heart, heart attacks. Um, if you have a high um, homocysteine after, after a heart attack, the, the treatment of choice would be folic acid. Uh, and so folic acid is very, very important for a lot of things, uh, including inflammation. And, uh, you know, it's, it's all coming back to this uh, cytok cytokine storm, inflammation, autoimmune kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I, I would bet that there may be a story behind MTHFR and the people at risk developing this. And that's just my gut feeling, just talking to you for about an hour. Yeah. We test for that. I, and my peds practice is also a behavioral health practice. And oh. um, we test for, uh, we do genetics testing daily. And, and, and MTHFR testing um, daily, and find so such a high number of deficiencies. And I myself tested myself, and yes, I'm deficient. Um, ADHD, MTHFR, so long, yeah, yep. Um, and high strong, as David says. Mm -hmm. And you know, so I 100% agree with the the MTHFR connection has got to be somewhere in that and. Um, you know, the first thing we do is put people on, you know, ironically, smarty pants, vitamins, or in light oh. or, um, you know, something to replace that folic acid B12, you know, those kind of mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, John was talking about uh, David and uh, PHQ9. I don't know if you know what that is. It's a very easy uh, nine question kind of uh, how, how depressed you are. And then you mm -hmm. get a score. And we, we use this, it's the quickest thing that we have in, in practice that you can give to the patient. It takes uh, re really 45 seconds to, to, to take. And, um, and what we do is we, we do it before treatment and then we, we give the treatment, whatever it is, if it's medicines or what we also do is transcranial magnetic stimulation. And um, uh, over time, we look at the scores. And mm -hmm. it's a pretty easy thing to, uh, I, I know you said you were overwhelmed, but it really is. Uh, something you can just give to the patient while they're sitting there uh, filling out paperwork. And I'd yeah. be curious how many people start depressed and then um, after your treatment, the depression improves. That may be a, f a focus um, for future, you know, indications because I, I am aware that the, the stellate ganglion uh, procedures use off label for, for PTSD. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm in the military also, and that's really where I got my experience with the stellate ganglion injection was 
uh, PTSD, you know, for our mm -hmm. veterans. And um, so uh, absolutely. And, and so the anxiety, depression, PTSD, uh, as far as I'm concerned, goes hand in hand, you know, one and the other. Yeah. Um, and ironically, you know what the best treatment for PTSD is, are medicines that reduce the, uh, the, the adrenergic tone. So again, it's, it's going back to uh, hyperactive uh, sympathetic, sympathetic. Yeah. Uh, activity. Yeah, hyper uh, an overreacting sympathetic system. Yeah, um, if we can shut that down, um, reboot it. Um, I, I even think um, you know what Jennifer was talking about. I'm I'm connecting my patients with um, a gentleman named Chase Thornock, who is um, teaches basically autonomic mastery that with simple breathing techniques, the Wim Hof method of breathing. Mm -hmm. uh, so breathing and cold. Um, to exercise that sympathetic system, symp sympathetic autonomic reflex that we can, can exercise that um, to allow it to return to a normal state when it's stressed out through um, uh, a, a trauma, uh, an infection, an illness, uh, you, you know, a car accident, whatever might come at us that, that, that is a threat to our body. Um, that that it won't get stuck in this dysfunction, but that it can return back to a, a normal state. So, that, I I don't think my little injection is is uh, the end all by by any means. Um, I I think it's um, a big head start for these people, and it's an opportunity for them to to get out of the huge depression and and state that they're in. And, and get them on a road to something to recovery. And, uh, but it, yeah, I, I, I think, I wish I knew more, you know, I, I don't know enough. And I wish I, I knew more about what medications could we give them? Could a benzodiazepine and anxiety and anxiolytic, could that bring them down and reduce some of that sympathetic drive um, as they're kind of recovering through this? Would, you know, folic acid help them? Would certain vitamins um, help? Um, obviously, I think breathing and, and cold, I think stretching and strengthening that autonomic system themselves without drugs uh, is meaningful. Meditation, prayer, um, what, you know, cognitive behavior therapy, whatever we could do to, um, you know, get them to reduce their stress levels and um, bring that, that sympathetic tone down, I think is going to be uh, beneficial for them in the long, in the long term. You know, one of the one of the odd, maybe unlikely benefits of this horrible last two years of this disease is there is now people like yourself, David, Dr. Taka, Jennifer, who are looking at autonomic nervous system dysfunction, starting to kind of go into that and explore it. We don't do a great deal of talking about that with patients as much um, uh, in the rooms quickly. You know, we're more reactive sometimes, but I think uh, this autonomic uh, dysfunction that is in, the, in this particular disease state really points to an opportunity for us to look at some of these things and get some details. I, I think your work that you've done, David, is, uh, I don't think you're giving yourself maybe enough credit and, uh, and Jennifer, you too, not, not only from a, from a, uh, patient standpoint, but you know, the work you're doing, uh, managing 50,000 people in a Facebook group across the world is, is, it's phenomenal. It, it's, I mean, you're real. Kid. Yeah, it really yeah. is. It really is. And, I can and so get everybody people knows. to where I am. It's all worth it. And you know, the the we do the PHQ nine daily too. And and David and I kind of briefly talked about this last time with you, John. And I still want to get with him because I'm willing to do the paperwork on the PHQ nines before and after, and and get the you know he can send them to me. I can send them to him and get the patients to do them before and after that kind of stuff, because I do think that this procedure like y'all have discussed is um touching very the edge of what it could possibly do for people i just do are you in texas also jen i'm not i'm in florida i'm in, oh, the, in florida. Okay. the panhandle of florida uh driving all be in texas. i know right <laughs> hey now college station i fell in love with college station but uh, i'm not sure my grandchildren would be happy about that but um, I would, I would make multiple trips over there to, you know, make this happen and, and, you know, find some answers to a lot of people's pain. We need it. 
Yeah, it's well, it's fantastic. And and you know, David, I'd like to come down and see you. I you were you're kidding me on the pre-interview to that you take all volunteers, but I I would like to come down. <laughs> Heck, I could do P I could do PHQ nines for, for your patients for, for a few I, days. I'd love it. I'd love it. Y'all make it sound easy. So I may edit, I may, I may just start adding it. Um, I've, got know, a, we, I've got a road trip partner with Mike Jones. So we'll, he, he knows that area very well. What, well, so me what's in the car. Next? I'll go with y'all. Okay. Yeah. We'll I'll have a college station meeting. Hey, I feel left next? out. I got, the, I think I got to travel there too. <laughs> oh yeah. Now Dr. Tiger, you got to go too. <laughs> what's so finally as we wrap this up what's next and what's the what's the message for people out there with this disease state there is hope i think is is the enlightening thing there's been a, a two years of people suffering but there are people getting extraordinary responses with david gaskin jennifer knight is an example of that um so join the facebook group and that facebook group's name is jennifer oh, so we wait, have let it. Me get it let me get it exactly because i um i pulled it up a minute Ago, just so Parasomia, I exactly. Phantosomia support Rosmia group. Rosmia post COVID support group. Perfect. Perfect. Go on to that and you'll get in. If you join that private Facebook group, you'll see Jennifer. You'll see David Gaskin when he's, when he's not working, which is very, very little times. <laughs> and uh, they can, they can reach out to that and talk and talk to other people, over 50,000 people from around the world who will understand what they're going through. Correct? Correct. Mm, absolutely. Well, thank you for the work that you've done. Dr. Taka, thank you for your support tonight and giving us so much insight in from your medical background. I just find this fascinating. And this is just the beginning of the story, I feel like. I, I agree, Dr. Taka. I, I, I don't know where this is going to go, but... Uh, uh, we may we may sit back and look at this podcast uh, 20 years from now and, and uh, you know realize we were you know I hope we're at the tip of a spear that that uh, penetrates real deep you know to help a lot of people um, it's mind-boggling if if we could if we could break this code of autonomic dysfunction um, could we could we break diabetes hypertension rheumatoid arthritis lupus if we break the code we 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 break all those think about that it it, it does sound like <laughs> an elegant doorway to all of that yeah all of those uh disease states have a uh component of uh you know an autonomic dysregulation yeah Diabetes. yeah i love yeah. that you're absolutely all the right. Inflammatory response right all the hyper inflammatory response autonomic dysfunction crohn's disease Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, myler stanlos <laughs> I mean, it just goes on and on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if if you look at it, I, you know, like I said, I wish I was smarter. I wish I knew more. But it it, um, it, it seems if you crack one, you you crack them all. You know, you you affect them all. Um, we just got to find that answer for the one. Maybe we yeah, have. I, I love like-minded thinkers like you that think out of the box and ask uh, these questions. Um, there's no stupid questions, you know, just stupid answers. And uh, I, I love the questions you're asking. If, if it works here, why can't it uh, work there? Right. I, why not? Exactly. What if, you know, sometimes you got to answer what if. Yeah. It's the fun part. It's the fun part of, of, of the industry, right? The, the really being involved in it. Jennifer, I don't, I don't say that lightly because I know what you have gone through has not been fun. And I know it's so many of the other people who are out there suffering. And I want to reemphasize that for those people who've come across um, this particular disease state, you're not alone. There are people out there who will understand if you don't have somebody um, who is understanding or, um, other people around you are judgmental. Um, join the Facebook group. Talk to a talk to your provider. Go see a a uh, behavioral health specialist or a primary care physician or nurse practitioner or nurse or some clinician who will listen to you. And there's a lot of people who do understand this. So you're not alone out there. And um, people are really really looking to help you. Well, everyone, thank you so much for your time uh, today on Nobody's Perfect Podcast. You've all been spectacular. And let's not let this be the last time we 
do this. David, can you also uh, give, a, give yourself a way for uh, people to um, connect with you directly down here in Texas? Uh, you, can, you can reach me at the office, 979-703-1426. You can email me at david at republicpainsp.com. Um, uh, we'll, we'll answer anything you can get. Text me, call me, email me, send a smoke signal. I don't care. What's the name of your clinic, David? Republic Pain Specialist. Perfect. Thank in you. Station. Yep, in College that's Station. Great. That's great. And we'll put that we'll put that on the video here and we'll attach it to attach it to the podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you guys. Thank you all for your time and thank you for your work. Thank you, everybody. Wonderful to meet you too, Dr. Taka. Likewise, guys. Yeah. Thank and you. I, and and I and I I'm thinking we're probably going to do more of these. I just have so many questions, you know, yeah. I, I might even spend some time there just to watch you because this really kind of talks to me. Uh, my, my brain is kind of, you know, thinking, uh, you know, possibilities as well. Could we combine it with a, with a Vegas stimulation? Would, Th that's what I was that thinking. <laughs> and I, I, you know, and this is not part of the psych the typical psych psychiatric kind of knowledge base. I had to learn. Yeah. pain pathways. I had to learn cranial neurophysiology. I had to learn. Now I have to admit the, the stellate ganglion is not, not uh, something I, I, I remember. Um, but mm. I do remember that, that there's a, uh, uh, a ganglion area in that, and, and it, it, it comprises of the vagus nerve. And I believe the phrenic nerve. Um, They're and, close. They're close. But the, yeah. the, the, the stellate or the sympathetic <laughs> chain has some innervation of the vagus itself. Um, That's right. They're, they're not uh, independent of each other. Um, Correct. So uh, th that, but you know, the whole idea is we're tr they're reflexively working. If I can, if we can either stimulate vagus or we can shut down sympathetic, um, we're we're going to help these people. So right. maybe we do both. You know, you're working on one, I'm working on the other. What if we did both at the same time? True. There's so many questions, so many yeah. what ifs. Yeah. You know. Absolutely. David, I've got another one for you. Have, have, have you had any patients who've had the implantable neurostimulators, you know, on the spine stimulators that you probably spinal have done or come across I've, the spinal stimulator? I've, I've had a couple of patients that, yeah, due to pain, had a neuro uh, uh, spinal cord stem, but um, not a, a vagus nerve stimulator. Or, uh, you know, I used to put on uh, auricular uh, stimulators, uh, vagus stimulators. Um, and I mm -hmm. wonder if, if something like that would actually help, like I said, stimulate the vagus while I shut down the, the um, stellate. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a lot of things like, how do we make this better? A patient asked me one time, can you give me a stronger block? And, and that struck with me, like, how do I give a stronger sympathetic block? You know, uh, all I know is, is, you know, you either get a block or you don't get a block. You know, you either, you either block, it, you know, it's an electrical impulse, but that made sense to me. Like, how do I actually gain a stronger sympathetic block? Um, I've thought of, you know, if I added um, ketamine, did a ketamine uh, infusion um, and a stellate gain block, you know, um, ketamine is the kind of the, the pharma pharmacological equivalent of, you know, the uh, sympathetic block. So now I'm thinking Vegas stimulation. There's, there's, uh, there's just, there's a lot needs to be done. A lot of answers, questions that, that don't have answers to right now. No, there definitely is. Well, I think to be continued, there's yes. more to talk about. Jennifer, we want to follow your progress. No and doubt. David, no doubt. In, yeah. your, in your work and your work and, and other people that we can be of service to um, in your Facebook group. So thank you so much for your time, Jennifer, David, Dr. Taka, Michael. This is John Cavanaugh from Nobody's Perfect Podcast. Thank you.